You asked for it, we got it. Well, you didn't really ask for it. But we're gonna give it to you anyway. <laughs> All right, how to kill your business, part two. We had a really good response from that video, yeah. so we kept writing experiences and lessons that we learned mm -hmm. that are just bad business practices for a woodworking business, so. Believe me, we got some. We've got some good tips. <laughs> we've, got, we've got plenty of mistakes. So anyway, we're gonna just jump right in. Do we have any bonus tips today? I think we have, I think we have a bonus tip today. I think today. we have a bonus tip. I'm gonna quit talking about what I'm gonna talk about and just talk about it. Let's go. Uh -huh. It will kill your business if you do not have a consistent pricing structure. If you're just kind of shooting from the hip, spitballing your prices, pew, 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 or you're just taking whatever somebody's gonna offer you on Facebook Marketplace, that's a really terrible way to do business for a lot of reasons. Number one, your customers don't have any sort of rational understanding of why you're charging the amount that you do. Now, I don't recommend that you itemize every single thing on the invoice, but at the same time, you also need to just have a consistent pricing structure across the board so that when you charge $300 for a coffee table and $600 for a nightstand, you can point to the complexity of the nightstand and say, this is why this one costs more than your coffee table. People are gonna be able to sniff that out really quickly. They can sniff out your lack of confidence in your pricing structure, and they're just gonna think to themselves, hmm, this guy really doesn't know what he's doing. He's not very credible, and I'm gonna go find somebody who already has a consistent business. I mean, think about a business like McDonald's, right? Like, this has already been figured out for you by other businesses. You, people go to McDonald's because of the consistency, not because it's healthy or good food. People should understand that with, when it comes to your business, consistency is everything. The quality of your work needs to be consistent from beginning to end, and part of that is your pricing structure. People need to know exactly how much you cost and exactly how strong and good quality your stuff is. And the more consistent you are, the more reliable you're gonna to be to your customer. So the basic formula that we use for price is very simple, and this is what we recommend beginning woodworkers should use. This is if you're building cornhole tables, this is if you're building like very basic benches, uh, picnic tables, stuff like that. Take your price of materials and your labor at $30 an hour, and you take those two, add them up, multiply times 1.4 to get a 40% markup and that's gonna land you your estimated price of what you should quote the job. Now do your best guess to estimate the different materials and labor costs and then add your 40% and that 40% is where the business makes money. That's your fudge factor, that's where you can mess up. If you totally screw up a cornhole board, you can build another one, that comes out of your margin. So you get paid based on your hourly rate, you also cover your materials and then your business profits with the markup. That's the whole point of the markup. It's not price gouging, you're not screwing your customers over, don't feel bad about it. This is just how businesses work. This is how Nike sells $600 sneakers, Apple sells $1,000 iPhones. This is just how business is done and you gotta be comfortable with that. And again, this just comes with time. But have some sort of a consistent formula, that way your customers can kinda of say, okay, I, I see why this costs that much and this costs something else. All right, so the second thing that will kill your business is perfectionism. First off, Absolute perfectionism, it's impossible to attain. So your project is not going to be 100% perfect without a single flaw or a single indication that it was a handmade piece of furniture. The way we think of it is the 80-20 rule. Once you get to the point where you are spending 80% of your time on only 20% of that project, it's probably time to call it good enough, make it high enough quality to match what you do for your typical projects for all of your clients, but it's time to move on because honestly, if you are spending five extra hours on you know that one joint or getting one thing just right, the customer is not gonna notice those five extra hours you put into perfecting that little itty bitty 20% of that one corner on your table. But what they will notice is the five extra hours in labor that you're charging them because you spent five extra hours when you didn't necessarily need to or they wouldn't notice. Because think of it this way, Handmade furniture is is not perfect, it's handmade. It's not gonna be your perfect Ikea furniture that came straight from the factory. It, it has character, and that's why people want handmade furniture. That's why they've come to get the craftsmanship. So we actually got almost this exact question or something relating to it in the stud stack the other day. They were just asking, hey, I want to perfect this. Should I go longer and perfect it or should I just leave it how it is? Um, and our response was, hey, 
Go look at an antique store and look at some of that old furniture that's still sitting there. Look at the joints, right? Everybody's, you know, it's this antique furniture. It was made in a better time. It was supposed to be perfect and the highest quality. But if you go look at it, there's gaps in the joints. It's not always perfect, but you know what? That piece is still sought after and it's lasted long enough to still be standing in that antique store, but it's not 100% perfect and that's okay. This idea of like, perfect Instagram joints is not necessarily realistic. That's something that's newer that we're just now seeing is everything being so, so perfect. And so now that's what everybody desires. That's what all the woodworkers want to gravitate toward. But honestly, that's not necessarily what your customers are paying for. If they want it to be absolutely perfect and your joints to be ideal and look just like the thing they saw on Instagram, well, then you got to let them know that's going to take me some time and that's going to be factored into the cost. But if they don't specifically say that to you, that's something they're not really thinking about going into the overall labor costs. So another way you can think of this is, um, imagine your first day on the job at like a regular job, not a woodworking job. So let's say you write invoices for a company. That's, that's your main job. The first time you ever looked at an invoice when you were brand spanking new, day one on the job, you probably looked at it and went, yup. That's an invoice <laughs> and didn't really think much of it. You're just like, okay, this is what invoices look like. Cool. But after you've been working there, maybe four or five years, you're going to look at that same invoice just by glancing at it. You're going to find like four or five things that are maybe wrong or inconsistent or spacing is off or something was added differently, but only because you've been doing it for that four or five years. Your customer is like you on day one, looking at that invoice. They don't exactly know what they're looking at. They just know it's an invoice. And the woodworker is like the person that's been working there four or five years that can just glance at it and find four or five things wrong with it. So just know that you are going to have a much more technical eye for stuff, whereas your customer, not necessarily, because they haven't been doing it. The experience they have is, you know, scrolling on Pinterest or looking on Instagram. And what matters to you is not necessarily what matters to them. The average customer really just wants it to be strong and last a long time and look pretty. They don't necessarily need it to be perfect. All right, we want to take a couple seconds to talk about the sponsor of this week's video, which is Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes covering dozens of creative and entrepreneurial skills. Explore classes in everything from photography and creative writing to marketing, productivity, and more. Premium membership gives you an unlimited access to high quality classes from experts working in their fields to help you gain new skills and live your best life. Skillshare is also incredibly affordable. An annual subscription is less than $10 a month. So I recently found a class that was all on interior design in Skillshare and I absolutely love interior design. That is like what I live for. I love tying your room together and making it all have one feel. And that's entirely what this class was about. They talked about color, they talked about shape, shadows, everything like that. And it went down into the details to help you be able to do it more easily. I know for some people it's a nightmare having to decorate their entire house. They don't know where to start. So I would highly recommend that course. But like, like we said, Skillshare has a ton of stuff like that. Um, they help you make difficult things easy, essentially. And if you click the link in the description or you go to this website right here, you'll be able to get two months of Skillshare Premium for free. We've been using this product for years, so we really think you'll like it. What is this, number three? All right, so number three is dealing with suboptimal tools. I see so many people terrified to make a big tool purchase. I'm talking to myself too. This, like, We learned this lesson the hard way. Um, our beloved track saw that we love so much, we spent way too much time being worried about the $500 price tag and then literally the first project we use it on, it paid for itself. Just, it's incredible how much rationalization we will do to try to get out of buying a new tool because I know if we all went crazy and we didn't keep track of ourselves, we'd buy every single tool at the hardware store and we'd have no self-control. In your business, you can't treat it like you do your personal finance. Businesses, you have to focus on the money coming in, not the money going out. So if there's a tool that's gonna do things quicker, faster, easier for you, you need to upgrade it. You don't, I was just talking to a guy on Instagram who was talking about upgrading his miter saw. They've got the one from Harbor Freight, which is fine. If you're just starting out, you're just getting into woodworking, that's fine, just buy the cheap one. But they were at the point now where it's like, hey, we need to upgrade to a, a better tool. And I said, go for it. It's another reason we recommend having separate bank accounts. So you, it's business money. It's not emotionally tied to your paycheck. It's money that's already been earned by the business and you can spend it without feeling as guilty as you would if you were spending it out of your own pocket. So yeah, buy the tools that you need, upgrade when you need to, and focus on the money coming in instead of the money coming out. Because if all it takes is one or two extra sales, 
to pay for a tool, the amount of time the tool is gonna save you, you can go close one or two more deals to make the tool pay for itself. Spend more time closing deals and less time dealing with crappier tools that don't do the job you need them to do. All right, number four. This one is gonna be doing everything yourself. So a lot of times makers do like to do everything themselves. Sometimes it's a pride thing where you're like, I got this, I can build and do contracts and do my own taxes, it'll be great. But honestly, if you are building your business right from the beginning and you your one goal is to just grow, you wanna grow and grow and grow, then you should be getting too busy to do everything by yourself after a certain point. And once you hit that, it's not gonna be worth your time or your money to be doing things like contracts or your own taxes or cleaning your shop, things like that. So once you get to the point where you are getting so busy and you have so many re people requesting builds from you, um, if you have the means, you should be hiring that out to people and delegating and finding another way to get it done so that you have the time to go get these sales, make everything that you need to make and continue to grow your business instead of spending you know, two hours cleaning your shop on a Saturday when you could be out talking to potential clients. Because honestly, it's much easier to you know, pay a neighbor kid who's looking for some summer work to sweep your garage than lose a $2,000 sale because you were busy cleaning your own garage. And this is not just throwing your responsibility to the side due to laziness and you just don't wanna do this or whatever. You're still responsible for it, you're still accountable for it, but you are just taking responsibility for it in the means that a business owner or business leader should be. And delegating it to somebody who can do it much quicker and easier and cheaper, and then you're getting two things done at once. Your shop's getting clean while you're out talking to business owners. Pew, pew, pew. All right, number five. This one has to do with hesitating to take bigger jobs that will kill your business. Again, everything should be focused on money coming in, not money going out. And if you're afraid to take on a bigger job because you don't feel like you can handle it, you've never done something that big before, you're really not gonna grow. So for example, about a, I don't know, what is it, about a year ago, we submitted a bid for a restaurant build out. We have a like we have a three car garage and we only use one stall of the three car garage, but we put a bid in anyway because we wanted to stretch and grow. We were still gonna deliver a good product. The deal fell through, the restaurant never ended up getting made anyway, but we were in the running. Like I think we were the only person that they contacted to build furniture anyway. So the amount of stuff that we learned just from putting that bid together really showed us that, hey, this is possible. We have all of our ducks in a row now, so if another opportunity like that springs up, all we have to do is edit the pitch, change the style of the furniture, and submit it to the new clients. And we learned so much just from that one thing that it really just kind of expanded our horizon, stretched us, made us want to grow, and kind of got us out of our comfort zone, which is exactly what you should be doing as a business owner, because you never know what opportunities are gonna to lead to the most amount of money, and you need to be able to follow everything as far as you can within reason to see what the most fruitful business venture is for you. And again, I don't want you to go crazy here. I don't think you're gonna bite off more than you can chew. Yeah, it was gonna be stressful if we had to build, I think it was like 15 tables and benches to go along with them. Like, yeah, that was gonna be overloaded. We were gonna have to find somewhere to put all the extra stuff once we had built it before we delivered it. But we weren't completely going out of our skill set. We were still we still knew how to weld, we still know how to make tabletops, we still know how to make benches. If at all possible, try to stretch and grow yourself. That way you can find your own limits instead of just arbitrary declaring them and counting yourself out before you even have a chance to see a good payday. All right, I got a bonus tip for you. You ready for this? I'm pretty sure I'm ready. So we've talked about this on our channel before, but it's blaming your customers or other people when the responsibility is on you, the business owner. This is something that we kind of fell into the trap of right as soon as we were transitioning into like, hey, this is a fun hobby and our friends like paying us for it, but I don't know if yeah. we should do the business. We just started blaming the community for all of our own problems. We sucked at sales. We were terrible at marketing. We didn't know how to draw in front of the customer and show them, like we didn't have a contract for them to sign. Like it was all our problems and we were like, why are the customers just like lining up to buy stuff from us? That's not how it works. Right. So don't blame your customers. It's all you. You may not be in the right area. And if you really want a woodworking business, you might need to move. You might not know the right people. Hey, you might need to make some new friends mm -hmm. or you might need to find a new place to hang out yeah, on Saturdays. That's the, biggest one. the people that you're around right now may not be the ones that have the money to spend on nice furniture. You need to get some new friends. And that learning that lesson is what prompted our video on where to find customers. It's the uh, the one where we draw on the iPad and we kind of animate like, hey, where do you find these good customers? And we narrow it down where we're like, hey, this might only be 
you know, a smaller amount of people, but those small amount of people have the money to pay you for your work. So if you haven't seen that video, go check that one out. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, I really hope you enjoyed this one. We try to keep it short and sweet for you. Uh, hit that like button if you thought it was valuable. And what did we miss? What are some other lessons yeah. that you guys have learned where you almost ended your business? I'd love to love to hear your stories and we can learn from each other. Haha. -ha. Ah, yes. Got it. Otto von Bismarck. Only a fool learns from his own mistakes. The wise man learns from the mistakes of others. So there's your quote of the day. We could have made that a that alone the bonus tip. We should have just made that bonus tip. Read him a quote. Two bonus tips. You're welcome. Yep. Peace. Man, whoever said sequels were not as good as the first one.